Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Arkanasa Radio Studios in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the Mothman, who has been showing up in and around Chicago here lately. This is December 16th, 2017. Before we get going, I'd just like to tell you about a little something happened to me last Saturday. We went to the Laredo Public Library for a book fair. I was hoping to sell a few copies of my series called The Bag Company. The story is about a 17-year-old girl who has to go to work in order to help her folks get out of debt. Seeing as she has absolutely no experience, she winds up working for her weird uncle, the guy no one ever talks about. He runs a paranormal company out of an old mansion. There's a werewolf looking for help. A monster that lives in the basement that wants to eat her. It's a fun story, and I kind of wrote it for anybody that wants to read. As I stood there looking out over the crowd, a young girl walked up to me. She said she was eight years old. She asked if I recognized her. Yes, I did. Her mother had bought the first book in the series for her last year. The little girl went on to expound on how much she loved the book, and she was coming to the finish soon. Then she asked me about the second book in the series. I told her about the bag company, Here We Go Again. There is a frost demon that is released on the town, and Pam's home is soon completely cut off from the rest of the world in a mid-July snowstorm. The little girl looked excited. She fluttered her eyelashes. She gave me her biggest smile. Her huge brown eyes twinkled. And then she asked if she could have a copy. The important word there was have, as in free. It's nearly Christmas time, so I gave her an autographed copy. She was so thrilled, she ran back to show her mother her new book. An hour later, she was back trying to get the bag company number three, the bag go squatching. Okay, it's Christmas time, and I'm not starving, so I gave her number three as well. Well, now the bag company had a weird start. I didn't start out to write a series, and it wasn't going to be about a 17-year-old girl. The book started out being about an 18-year-old boy. I wrote several pages, but I couldn't get the main character to work out the way I wanted the story to go. Eighteen-year-old boys don't usually do what they're told. They tend to think they know everything already and don't much like fighting with one of my characters. Believe it or not, sometimes characters in books will act as if they have their own ideas on how the book should go. I tried wrestling the story onto the pages, but found the outcome was not what I wanted. So I changed the main character to an 18-year-old girl who once more refused to follow in my plans. I transformed her into a 17-year-old girl, and I took away most of her confidence. I made her a very well-behaved, if somewhat rebellious person in her own mind. I then got about making her life as miserable as I could. The cell phones don't work at the office. There are no computers either. She has to look for information in books and ask the staff at the office for advice. Then Pam discovers she can see and talk to ghosts. When the ghosts find out she can hear them, they flock to her with requests to pass on things to their friends and family. 
The story worked out as planned, and according to my eight-year-old fan, it's a very good book. You can get your own copy at the Organic Man Coffee Trike at 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9, or order a copy at Amazon.com. It's just good, clean fun with a twist. Here is the opening few pages to get you in the mood to read the entire story. Hopefully this will entice some of you all to buy a copy of your own. Have you ever heard the sage advice that went, If you don't understand Latin, don't read it out loud. This is very good advice. It's written down in easy to understand English on page 14 of the extremely informative tome called The B-Movie Survival Guide, lovingly put down on paper by Gary Cook, Debbie Rochon, and Peter Schmidget. Available for $9.95 at Amazon.com or less or maybe more from a used bookstore or for free if you borrow it from a friend. Good advice had it been taken. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of words drifting on the wind unheeded. Bob Newman had found the old book in a cardboard box under a pile of trash under a bigger pile of discarded household items in the dump out beyond the edge of town. The words were pretty much meaningless to him or his cohorts. They all shared a dislike of anything educational or enlightening or historic. You could say they were just a bunch of schoolish twits. Hey, maybe we can sell it to a used bookstore, Drake, one of his buds, had suggested. Or better... Uh, drop it off an overpass onto a car in the middle of the night. The book was quite large and weighed in at about 18 pounds, and it measured 24 by 18 inches. Juan was fond of dropping things from bridges, usually turkey giblets. The cover was some kind of a leathery-looking stuff, uh, probably goat or cow, and it was worn-looking. Opening the old and musty tome, Bob quickly discovered he had no idea what was written in the many pages. What does it say? asked one of the non-educated bumpkins. It says, Staltus non pelego hoc, whatever that means. If Bob had paid more attention in the Latin class that he had been offered but never taken, he would have known that it said, Idiot, don't read this book. So what should we do? Sell it or drop it on a car? I say, let's read some more. It sounds cool. Bob thought big words sounded cool in any language. Flipping over to the next page, he was thrilled to see an illustration. Oh, look, it's got pictures. He held the book upside down so his fellow intellectually challenged boobs could take in the ancient-looking drawing. The illustration showed a group of men. They must have been med. They all had beards. Or maybe they were just hairy women. Anyway, they were shown standing in a circle around what must be a bonfire. Hey, it looks like they're having a cookout. Not a bad idea. It's kind of cold out here. I'm going to start a fire. This would be far beyond the young Cretan's ability, if not for the giant can of lighter fluid he had brought along for just such a purpose. There was plenty of wood since this was a dump. It took him less time to start a raging fire than it would take him to fill out a job application. Hey, you know what would be cool? Let's stand around the fire like those guys in the picture. This sounds like an extraordinarily bad idea, but bad ideas were the only kind Milton had. They positioned themselves in a circle, around the now smoking, burning, smelly pile of wood, taking up positions just like in the book's illustration showed. What they lacked in thought process, they made up for in being able to recreate a picture. Bob went on with the reading, if that was indeed what he was doing. It had as much to do with reading as a parrot being able to reason out what it was saying. Actually, some parrots hold a far better reasoning ability than the combined IQ 
of five of the six doofuses in the dump. If these fine upstanding examples of what not to be had spent the night at the local coffee shop drinking espresso and contemplating the meaning of life instead of guzzling beer and contemplating the meaning of words they didn't understand, their world might have taken on a much rosier hue. You know what this reminds me of? One of those horror movies, you know, where some monster turns up and kills everyone. This not-too-bright statement came from Waldo, a new member of the Ignoramus Club. He hung around because these were the only guys that would put up with his nonsense. He was what you might call a nerd. Look, there's another picture. Only this one looks kind of scary. Indeed it did. It showed the men standing around the fire had conjured up some unthinkable creature from another dimension. A very nasty one at that. Wow, that looks just like that thing over there. And we're going to take a brief pause here and play a couple commercials. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. Coffee, nectar of the gods. And at the Organic Man Coffee Trike, you'll find coffee made the right way. One delicious cup at a time. Stop on by 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. And remember, life is too short to drink bad coffee. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, Stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Did you hear a bump in the night and you think it just might be a ghost? Contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at Laredo Paranormal at Hotmail.com That's the LPRS for all your otherworldly needs. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back to the show. Uh, Just reading a few pages out of my book, The Bag Company. In Chapter 2, Pamela Bogus. I never actually describe Pam in any of the books. I let the readers choose how she looks. In fact, a few of my characters are described unless it's necessary for the story, such as Hortense Medusa, who stands as six foot eight, and she likes to wear all black, or Cassandra Blavatsky, who is five feet tall, and she wears all blue. Aside from a few other characters, I don't mess around with descriptions because I figure the reader is going to think of the character however they want, and why should I mess with their ideas? And now back to the story. The sunlight was coming through the bedroom window, bringing the new day into focus. It shone on the dresser, covered with all the latest and greatest makeup available from the mall, from lip gloss to the exact shade of sunbeam to the bright green eyeliner that had been oh so popular for four days. The sunlight crawled across the room, lighting up the desktop, covered with paperwork, already sweated over, retyped, re-retyped again, 
turned in, graded, and returned. Formerly the most important thing in life, now just papers waiting to be dealt with in their final hour. The sunlight wasn't about to stop there. It scrolled across the room, looking for the bed, which looked more like a mound of discarded clothing. Having reached its destination, the light sought out the sole inhabitant, ensconced somewhere in the depths of the cottony tomb. The mound moved as if under some kind of semi-intelligent control. A sound escaped from the interior. From outside the domain of teenage languor, called as if from a less untidy dimension, came the sound of an adult voice. Pam, time to get up. You don't want to be late for your first day at work. There was no response from the huddled mass. The door to the teen territory swung open, giving the mother a clear shot at her slumbering offspring. Get up now. You've already missed breakfast. You'll have to grab something at work. Now let's go. Uncle Ray was nice enough to give you a job, so let's move it before you're eligible for Social Security. The bedclothes moved back, allowing a single extremity to venture forth, as if unsure of the safety of the surrounding arena. You have five minutes to get dressed and get going, the mother, better known as Mom, or procreator, but sometimes the creator, her friends called her Paula, walked over and peeled back a few layers of blankets and sheets till the pajama-clad form of her youngest and oldest, well, her only daughter, came into view. Better put on something besides what you're wearing. You can't show up dressed like that. But Pamela had gone to school on more than one occasion dressed in her jammies and winter coat. The fuzzy house shoes barely survived the last trip. Unable to resist the call of the mother, Pam pulled herself across the mattress. When one leg dangling from the edge, she levered her body upwards, nearly falling from the bed. The mother continued, You have to dress for a business, something nice like a dress and heels. Jeans and a t-shirt escaped from the partially open mouth. Dress and shoes. Your uncle runs a business, not a playground. This just wasn't fair. Summer vacation had arrived. Pam had survived three years of high school. She was an adult, kind of. Why couldn't she just lounge around the house and watch TV or text her friends? It was some kind of conspiracy between her mother and father. Teach her some responsibility, they had said. Give her some experience, they had said. Earn her own money for a change, they had said. So here she was, about to go to work. This isn't fair. Pam stumbled to her closet to see about a costume to appear at a place of employment. The car was sitting in the driveway. It was in need of a bit of work, but it was her car. Ever since her parents had gone to see some guy named Dave something, they'd been on this thing about money. Act your wage and don't spend money you don't have was a common theme around the house lately. They had performed some kind of a bizarre ritual in the kitchen. It was called plastic surgery. They had cut up all of their credit cards. Hers were sacrificed to the scissors as well. Nothing had weathered the storm of card cutting except her ATM, but with little actual cash in the bank, she was forced to get a job. Oh, the humiliation of it all. Her car, a 1980 Malibu, which had cost all of $2,007.19, had an AM-FM radio, and that was it. No CD, no auxiliary input, nothing. The only thing to listen to as she drove was a radio. All her friends were sporting brand new cars with everything. Her dad had said, Dave says we should pay cash from now on, so this will have to do until you can pay cash for the next one. Now climbing in, Pam fired up her chariot and headed away, away to a new chapter in her life, something called 
work. It wasn't as if her folks didn't have lots of money. It had been mostly in the form of credit, but wasn't that the same thing? Sure, a new car cost a lot of money, but that's what banks were for. Walk in, sign the paperwork, it was free money, right? Well, Pam's car ran all right, no smoke or drips, but it didn't have any zip, and people stared, or rather, they seemed to ignore her as if her and her car were not there. Checking her watch, the clock on the dash was running, but all the hands were going around in the wrong direction. It was time she was at work. I better step on it. The place of employment for a 17-year-old was, with zero experience, was on the side street way over in the less-than-upscale part of town. The building had been an old mansion at one time, a long time ago. A long, long time ago, way back when some guy may, named McKinley had been president. This had been a fine example of overspending. Three stories with a huge something out back. There were some windows missing from the third floor. And not just the glass, but the whole window, frame and all. A huge hole was all that was left where windows should have been. The yard had been turned into a parking lot. Uh, too bad it was mostly dirt. You could see where the stripes would have been by the weeds growing between the cars. Uh, several statues were occupying the front yard, and most were missing pieces. Uh, pigeon poo was the dominant color. A sign hung from the archway over the front porch. It said, The Bag Company. In tiny letters along the bottom was written, The Bogus Anomalous Group, Inc., this was her uncle's business. What in the world is an anomalous? Pam would have to look that one up. The front door stood open just a bit, and it looked anything but inviting. This was the scene in the horror movie where the heroine makes a stupid move, like going inside. Flipping a mental coin, either step through the door or jump in the car, drive to another state, change her name, and then what? Well, I guess I go in then. Pam walked to the door and stepped inside. She pushed the door shut. She pushed the door shut, but it only swung part way, then stopped. Prevented from closing by the frame that had warped. The curtains hanging on both sides of the door were lace and spiderweb, gray with dust from the last century or so. The foyer had been converted into a reception area, kind of. There was a desk, old and solid, made from a few trees, and a few mismatched chairs, one of which was occupied by a man in short pants and a t-shirt. It was just a bit hot in here. He looked to be about half awake, but he was unsure as to which half. The desk was fairly neat. A phone and a pen set, some papers in an in-and-out box. Behind the desk sat a huge bookshelf full of old leather-bound tomes. A fan sat in the corner, was stirring up the dust and making pages flutter as it rotated by the inbox. The man snored loudly, and then awoke to his own trumpeting call. Huh? What? Sorry. Is the healer ready for me yet? He looked at Pam as if she possessed some kind of answer for his question. Um, uh, a healer? Like as in, you have a... She ran out of stammerings. As the two stared at each other, a short, round woman came flowing from down the central hall, just to the right of the desk. She was close to five feet tall and nearly as wide. Her dress was all blue from her neck to her feet that just didn't quite seem to touch the floor. On her head sat a blue scarf, making her resemble a small mountain of blue silk. Roger, uh, sorry to keep you waiting. I was outside clearing myself. Bit of a wingding last night. 
The woman looked over at Pam. You must be the new receptionist. Ray will be along in a minute. Have a seat. Now, Roger, come with me. Let's see if we can clear your energy. The blue lady led Roger away back down the hallway behind the receptionist's desk. Pam watched to see if the woman was actually floating or not. It was kind of hard to say. Shortly, a door opened to the left of the room. Her uncle came walking in, a cup of coffee in his hand. Ah, um, uh, Paula, no, Pam, I thought you weren't going to make it. He didn't look at his watch, but the implication was there. Sorry, I overslept. A long night last night, working on a... There were no projects due for class. No homework was needed. There was just no way to get out of the fact that she'd stayed up watching TV and talking on her phone. Her uncle forged ahead. Come with me. I'll get you situated. He led her as far as the desk pointed to the office chair, left over from last century. This will be your desk. It's a bit old, but it gets the job done. He preferred the seat to her. Pam sat behind the desk, finding the chair was not too uncomfortable. The last occupant had left quite a dent in the sitter-downer section. She surveyed her surroundings. Her uncle gave her a tour of the desktop. You have a phone and a pen. If someone calls, take a note and see to it it gets to the proper party. The phone had a round dial with numbers on it. It's some kind of a retro looking device. The phone is probably older than you are, but it works, which is a good thing. There's something about the energy around here. It makes electronics go kaputski. He pointed at a shelf by the front door where a number of cell phones sat. It doesn't damage them, just makes them do odd things. Odd things. Pam figured her uncle was just being old-fashioned or something. He continued, Behind you is a small reference library. You get lots of use out of it. Consider it your best way to find things. Why not just use a computer? Remember, odd things. Odd things. Besides, some of the things you'll be looking for, you won't find on any computer. He looked as if there was more he wanted to say. To your left is the status board. It tells who's in or out. There was a blackboard with names written in chalk. Beside each name was a paper arrow taped in place. Let's you know who's around. Around around the office. Yes, around. He was about to say more, but instead he looked into his cup. Right, uh, coffee time. Come, I'll show you to the coffee shop. He pointed to the door he had come through a bit ago. The door was solid wood and very wide. There was a window positioned above the door, allowing some cross-ventilation. The window swung open from the top. Our staff spent so much time at the coffee shop drinking and talking and, and drinking, we decided to put in one of our own. Uh, what exactly is it you and your staff do here? Uh, Pam had been wondering about this for, oh, say, the last ten years. Whenever the subject of her uncle had come up, there had always been a long pause, uh, followed by a change of subject. We fix things. No, no, we, we solve problems. Or have a cup of joe and I'll, I'll fill you in as best as I can, as, as best I can. And that is all for now. If you'd like to read more of the BAG Company, it's available in paperback or Kindle. From where else? Amazon.com. And now... For the Mothman. December 15th, 1967, the Silver Bridge collapsed. 56 people died in the freezing water. Several of the bodies were never found. The collapse wouldn't have become such an historic anomaly if not for the preceding 13 months. 
The Mothman had been seen in and around Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Many folks believed this was a form of a warning. Others think the Mothman might have been responsible for the collapse. It all began back in November 15, 1966, when four young people were out driving through the countryside. At the time, there wasn't much to do on a Tuesday night. The Point Pleasant was a small town on the Ohio River. Back during World War II, the government ran a huge munitions facility in the area. The manufacture of explosives was quite deadly, so much of the work was done underground. There were dozens of tunnels and rooms built below the ground level. Once the war had come to an end, the site was shut down, leaving behind a warren of small buildings that looked kind of like igloos. Then, back in 1966, there wasn't much to do if you were young and you lived in a small town. There were maybe three or four channels on the TV. Most of the stores closed at sundown since people working in them had families to go to. Once the sun went down, you had to be creative if you wanted some form of entertainment. The two couples had decided to drive through the abandoned munitions facility, which was referred to as the TNT. This was an out-of-the-way location for young folks to get away from town. Lots of trees and winding roads. As the four drove along, one of them spotted what he thought was a man standing on the side of the road. The man looked odd standing there in the dark, so the driver told the others to look at the weird-looking guy. As they all looked, they noticed the eyes. The eyes were glowing bright red. Then, as they watched, a set of huge wings unfolded from the man's back. This was no man, but a giant bird of some kind. It leaped into the air and began flying along the road right behind their car. The driver began to go as fast as the narrow, winding road would permit. The bird man swooped down and passed over the car. They could only watch in fear as this giant bird flew back and forth, looking down on them with those glowing red coal fire eyes. As soon as the town drew into view, the giant bird man flew away. They made a beeline for the police station where they reported their bizarre encounter. The officer taking the report suspected alcohol was involved, but no one smelled from drink. There were no traces of drugs present. The officer had little recourse but to send a patrol unit out to have a look in the TNT area. Shortly after the couple's run-in, a man spotted a giant bird man standing in his yard. Once again, the creature was described as having red glowing eyes. It stood about seven feet tall, and it flew away into the night. Now, the Mothman is connected with Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in everyone's mind. The same Mothman, and folks will say, Point Pleasant. Well, November 17th, a teenage man saw an eight-foot-tall creature with glowing red eyes outside of Gallipolis, Ohio. The creature was flying along through the trees. Gallipolis, Ohio is just across the Ohio River from Point Pleasant. A few days later, five pilots were at the Gallipolis, Ohio airport when they spotted what they thought was an airplane. As it grew closer, they could see it was actually a bird. This bird was enormous. The pilots guessed the wingspan to be between 15 and 20 feet across. The giant bird flew over the airfield and looked down at the pilots. It took a few lazy flaps of its wings and sailed out of sight. It turns out that back in the early 1900s, there had been many reports of giant birds flying throughout the Ohio Valley. Maybe these giant bird sightings had been Mothman instead. Many of the sightings said the bird had a 15-foot wingspan. As more sightings were reported to the police in Point Pleasant, Mary Heyer wrote up a newspaper article about the big bird sightings and sent it off to her editor. 
The editor didn't like the name Big Bird, so he changed it to Mothman. If not for the TV show, the creature might have been called the Batman instead. John Keel, a writer who looked into UFOs and other sightings that were outside the normal news reports, was out researching UFO sightings when he heard about the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant. He thought there might be a good story to write about, so he drove over to ask the locals about what they'd seen. Now, John Keel was from New York City. The folks in West Virginia don't like talking to strangers, and John was met with polite silence. I've run into this on a few occasions while asking about odd occurrences in a town. If the folks there don't know you, they just assume you're there to ridicule them for being backwards or crazy. John was finding it near impossible to get any information on the Mothman sightings. He stopped by the police station and there he met Mary Heyer. He began his being a newspaper reporter. Correction, he being a news reporter and she was a bit more open to his questions. When she discovered he was there to hear the truth and not make fun of anyone, she told him she'd be willing to work with him. Now John was able to talk to the locals and they were a little more open to him. Having Mary along was making a big difference. Not only were people seeing these giant flying creatures, they were reporting UFO sightings as well. John began to wonder if the Mothman might be connected to the UFOs. As more reports of Mothman and strange lights in the sky came in, the Men in Black, or the MIBs, showed up as well. They began to show up everywhere. Sometimes they were seen just standing around looking somewhat intimidating. Other times they actually tried to get people to stop talking about what they'd seen. Mary Heyer was told by an MIB to stop looking into the Mothman sightings and to not speak to John Keel anymore because he was a fake. Two MIBs even tried to grab Mary's niece as she was walking along a street. Thirteen months after the first sighting, the Silver Bridge, which runs from Gallipoli, Ohio, to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, collapsed, killing 46 people. The Point Pleasant, being a small community, there wasn't a family in town that didn't either lose a family member or a close friend. The sighting of a Mothman-type creature continued, and they seemed to always precede some tremendous disaster. In Pripyat, Ukraine, the people had reported seeing some kind of a giant flying creature with bright red eyes. It was spotted in the wooded areas around town by many people, but nobody took the sighting seriously. On April 26, 1986, the staff of the nuclear power plant were doing a test on the cooling system. This staff went about shutting down the main cooling supply of water. The emergency backup should have safely cooled the core during the shutdown. Once the test was underway, the workers discovered the emergency backup mechanism didn't kick in, so they tried to reopen the primary cooling system, only to find the controls were frozen. The valve they had just closed was now stuck and couldn't be moved. An alarm went off and the town was evacuated. People were told to just take a few items because the problem should be fixed in a day or two. The folks living around the plant grabbed a few items to see them through the evening. No one took family heirlooms since they'd be back before too long. Turned out what sounded like a minor problem turned into a major disaster. The town of Pripyat is still abandoned today, 31 years later. The power plant was the Chernobyl Nuclear Power Station. People visiting the town today will find everything still in place, waiting for their owners to come back home. September 11, 2001, uh, people had seen a giant black shape flying away from the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center for days leading up to the terrorist attack. 
Some folks said the giant thing had red eyes that seemed to glow. In July 2007, people said they saw some kind of a giant bird man flying around Minneapolis, Minnesota. Most chose not to report the sighting, figuring people would say they were delusional or crazy. Then, on August 1st, right in the middle of rush hour traffic, the bridge going over I-35 collapsed, killing 13 people and injuring 145 others. After the tragedy, the witnesses felt compelled to come forward and tell what they'd seen. Not all the witnesses can be considered to be crazy or, or making things up. There are always those who jump on the news to get their face in public. There will always be a few who dreamed about some kind of creature like the Mothman and convinced themselves that they'd actually seen the creature. You can't rule out all of the witnesses. Many people had actually seen something flying about the skies over Minneapolis in the days leading up to the collapse. 2009, the folks in La Junta Chihuahua began seeing a large black flying creature with red eyes. It was spotted around the area, sometimes flying and sometimes standing on the ground. It even chased a few folks down the roads and caused quite a commotion. Then, swine flu began affecting the people of the region. Hundreds became sick and many of them died. Once the swine flu had run its course, the black shape vanished. Nobody reported seeing it any time after that. In Chicago of this year, back in March, a truck driver was sitting in his cab waiting on traffic when he saw something big and black up in the sky. It swooped past his windshield and he saw that it was a half man and half bat looking thing. He said the thing was huge and it passed right in front of him. This happened right around noontime. Lots of other people were looking up into the sky, but none of them chose to come forward and report what they'd seen. Had this been the only report, it could be written off as misidentification, although I have no idea what the guy might have seen and thought it was a giant flying man bat. may have been a hoax, but who could have pulled off such a thing? Yes, Hollywood can do this kind of thing, but it costs a few thousand dollars. That's a lot of cash to scare one man. You might think he was just trying to get some publicity for himself. The vast majority of folks would say the man was nuts, and few people want that kind of notoriety. So what did he see that caused such an impression? I found life was so much more fun once I stopped worrying about what others thought of me. I began wearing a hat with UFO magazine written across the front, just like the one Bill Burns wears. The people would look at the hat, and then they'd ask if I really believed in flying saucers. I'd tell them about how it was pretty much a given that there were things flying around our planet that didn't originate here. The person would then turn and look over their shoulder. They would step in close, and they would proceed to tell me about their sighting. Once they were done, they would invariably say, Don't tell anyone what I just said. They just wanted to get the story out so it didn't seem like such an unreal event. Now back to Chicago. Other people began seeing this flying creature. Later that same night, two women were out on the street when they heard a loud screeching sound. It was very loud and it sounded like a giant upset cat or maybe metal being torn apart. They looked up and they saw two flying creatures that they both described as looking like gargoyles. The two things were flying along, looking down, as if searching for something. Food, perhaps. The two women were glad to see the creatures flying away from them. They both described having a feeling of dread as they watched these flying things. Not long after this sighting, a group of people in a park saw a seven-foot-tall, 
flying man come swooping into the park. One of the witnesses was a police officer. The people all just stood there in disbelief as the flying creature landed, and well, then it looked around the park. After fulfilling whatever it was interested in, the creature jumped up into the air. It flew away out over the water, where three men out fishing saw the seven-foot-tall creature fly right over their heads. The fishermen said it looked more like a giant bat than a bird of any kind. The flying thing continued out towards the middle of the lake. April, a Lincoln Park neighborhood, a man took his dog out for a run to the local park. As they were getting close to Oz Park, the dog began to act as if something were wrong. It began to cower and it didn't want to get any closer to the park. Now this is odd behavior for any dog. Parks are filled with all the things that dogs love. The smell of other dogs work like a magnet. As the man practically drug his dog into the park, he noticed how quiet it was. The birds were not making their usual cacophony. The air was still, making it all that much quieter. An eerie feeling began to creep over him, but the man tried to shake it off as just being nervous. His dog was walking along, but it was huddled right up against his leg. Its tail hung down as if lacking in any joy at being in the park. As the pair rounded the corner and came to the baseball field, there, standing on the ground, was a seven-foot-tall bird man. The wings looked more like something you'd see on a bat, but the overall look was more of a bird. As soon as the bird man was in sight, the dog tried to hide by using his owner as a shield. It cowered around behind his legs and it began to shake, whining with fear. The bird man leaped up into the air, spread its wings and flew away into the night, letting out a screeching sound as it disappeared from sight. The same month, a couple were out on Lake Michigan when the woman spotted something in the night sky. At first, she thought it was a fruit bat or a flying fox. The fruit bat can get up to five and a half foot wingspan, but this thing looked bigger. The woman said it was at least as tall as her husband, who stood six foot four. Its wings were about 10 feet across. The creature circled the boat a few times, giving the couple a good look at it. The eyes were large and seemed to reflect the moonlight. The thing looked to be about as black as the sky above, but it was being silhouetted by the moon. After giving the couple a good fright, the flying thing turned and headed into shore, disappearing into the Montrose area, which kind of sticks out into the lake. Just after the couple lost sight of the winged thing, a group of young men who were just hanging out heard something big fly over their heads. One of them saw the source of the sound, and he told the others that he had just seen Lechuza. The Lechuza is a half-owl, half-woman, that has been seen all up and down along the Texas-Mexican border. Many of my friends have seen it, and they have told me about having the life scared out of them by this flying woman. The legend of the Lechuza goes back in a, into the old times. A woman living in a small town was accused of being a witch. When some of the townspeople began to have a run of bad luck, they decided the woman was to blame. They arrested her and hanged her. As she was dying, the woman called out to the devil to allow her to come back and seek revenge on those who had wronged her. She reemerged as a half-owl, half-woman, who then began to hunt down and kill all of the townspeople. Now that is just one of many stories. Another is, and she was a witch, who was in league with the devil, and as a reward for her services, she was returned from the grave as an owl woman who would then prey on the living. 
if you see the Lechuza and she doesn't swoop down and kill you, it's because she doesn't find you appealing. So, sometimes, she sometimes hides in the brush and she makes a sound like a crying baby. When people go out looking for the infant, they vanish, never to be seen again. Back in Chicago, the group wanted to see what the one man had seen, so they followed the sound around a corner. There, they saw the same thing. What looked like a giant owl was a human face. It stood well over six feet tall, and it had red, glowing eyes. The men yelled at the creature, and they started throwing rocks at it. The creature jumped up into the air and flew away. They all described it as being either a half-bird or a half-bat and human. We're going to take a brief pause here and play a couple commercials and drink some coffee. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Makeup isn't something you want to just smear on and hope for the best. You might come out looking like Lon Chaney. Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and get a free makeover to see how makeup should be done. 956 723 3019. Back in 1776, someone said, Give me coffee or give me death. And if that's how you feel, you should be at the Organic Man Coffee Tribe. They make coffee the right way, one delicious cup at a time. 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. Coffee, the stuff dreams are made of. Did you go out UFO hunting and couldn't focus on the sky? Swing on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte right across from the Embassy Suites. Because that's not a weather balloon, that's a flying saucer. This is Arkanasa Radio you've been listening to. And welcome back to the show. Be sure to check out the MajesticalCryptid.net for all of your cryptozoological needs. They have many stories from around the country about various things like the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. It's a well worth your time and effort to have a look. So go by the MajesticalCryptid.net. Now, once more, back in Lincoln Park, a couple out taking in an after-dinner walk saw a huge flying humanoid that they described as being from seven to eight feet tall with wings more like a bat than a bird. The thing flew along the street before climbing up into the sky. They said they both felt very uneasy about seeing this flying thing. At the International Produce Market, people saw what they described as the biggest owl in the world. It stood over seven feet tall, had yellowish-red eyes. It stood on the roof for a few minutes and then flew away. Most everybody agreed on the description. September, the two students were in their dorm room when they saw something looking in the window. The room was on the third floor, so nobody should have been able to stand just outside like that. The being had glowing red eyes and was giving the girls the feeling they just might be on its menu for the evening. It stared in at them for a few seconds and then flew away. They thought the creature might have been sitting on the window ledge or hovering just outside the window. It was as big as the entire window frame. 
Other students at the college came forward to say they'd seen a similar sight. They all described the creature as being from seven to eight feet tall, either black or dark brown, with glowing red or orange eyes, and the wings were like a bird or a bat. In October, another couple sighted a giant flying creature passing overhead. The woman said it kind of reminded her of a sugar glider, except for the glowing red eyes. It looked to be from six and a half to seven and a half feet long. The wings looked kind of like the membrane stretched from the front paws of the marsupial to the back paws. The flying creature looked as if it were gliding along without flapping its wings. Now there is some debate as to whether the Mothman is a cryptid or paranormal. A cryptid is an animal or a plant whose existence has been suggested but has not been discovered or documented by the scientific community. In plain English, this says a cryptid is an animal or plant that has been seen by thousands of people, but nobody sitting in a laboratory wearing a white coat has seen one in their building. A paranormal is considered to be anything beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding. Once more, the guy in the white coat hasn't seen it, so it doesn't exist. To me, paranormal is anything outside the common accepted confines of modern science. Things that exist but can't be proven. I know of folks who run around out in the woods looking for Bigfoot that think I'm crazy for believing in UFOs. I know ghost hunters who say Bigfoot is just a story made up to sell books. And I've talked to UFO researchers who tell me that ghosts don't exist. Some cryptozoologists act as if paranormal is a bad thing. Folks get all wrapped up in classifications and they lose sight of the fact there are things out there that just might exist and it's our job to go looking for them. Is Bigfoot paranormal? Is he beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding? Yes. Has the guy in the white lab coat sat down and talked to him? No. A Bigfoot is a cryptid that can also be paranormal. Bigfoot is paranormal and if you don't agree I'll just ignore what I just said. You're free to call him anything you like. If and when Bigfoot comes to my studio for an interview we'll ask him for his opinion. Now there are those folks that say that the Mothman was there to warn people of the coming disasters. If this was the case he did a lousy job telling people to stay off of the bridge. The same could be said for what happened in Minneapolis. Seeing a large flying bird circling an area doesn't entice anyone to stay away from that area. Personally, I'm of the opinion that Mothman wasn't there to warn anyone. I think that Mothman showed up in Point Pleasant, showed up in Minnesota, and showed up at the World Trade Center to feed on all of the negative energy coming from all of the people that the disaster affected. The only possible explanation would be that this is what causes the Mothman that has been seen around disasters to show up and what it's doing. So me, I don't think he's a harbinger of ill to come. I think he's there to feed on our negative energy. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, tell your friends about it. The archives can be found at strangethings.podomatic.com If you'd like to write to the show, perhaps you have a story you'd like to hear on the air, or maybe you have something you'd like to tell me, you can contact us at strangethings.arcanasa.com Dot com. And if you'd like to buy one of my books, they are all available at Amazon.com. The BAG company was the one I was talking about earlier, and get you a copy. You might find it's entertaining. I didn't write it just for little kids. I wrote it for anybody. Till next week. Are you, are you coming to the tree?
But they strung up a man the same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.